The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Money GPS is an Australian fintech that has created leading digital advice technology to meet the unserved advice needs of the 90% of working Australians who cannot afford traditional advice. Users take a fully client-led digital journey with access to hybrid human advisor support across superannuation, investment, retirement and insurance topics. Money GPS offers a turnkey solution to financial advisors, helping to future-proof their business by engaging non-advised clients, enhancing referral relationships and achieving scale through a technology and personal advice solution. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I have the pleasure of speaking with Tim Townsend, Townsend Combain Private Wealth Partners. Lots of people will probably know Tim from from the industry, speaking at at different events. But Tim, pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, Joe. Now, Tim, maybe let's talk about the business, Townsend Combain Private Wealth Partners. Tell us a bit about your, your, your financial advice business. What does it look like at the moment? Um, well, we're about 11 years into our journey, um, and in that period of time, we've built up a practice that um, we look after approximately about $360 million worth of assets, but importantly, that's for about 160 clients, and so the practice has been specifically positioned at a certain point of the market, and in particular, because we are committed to private, well, you know, a personalized service in a depersonalized world, I think, is the best way I could describe it. Uh, yeah. You know, where, where many of us are pursuing um, uh, enhanced efficiency, as we do as well through the use of technology, we have been incredibly focused on continuing to deliver highly personalized service, which much of our industry does. But unfortunately, personalized service costs money to deliver. So you've got to keep that ratio right. Yeah, I remember hearing you talk about it. At- it's some point along along the journey of of your business with this idea of you you wanted to keep it small enough in a way that you didn't have to refer to the client's file to remember who they were up to and what they were doing and and that kind of stuck with me. I think you might have been on stage at some some presentation you were that you were doing. So you've kept it reasonably small in in the in this in this in the scheme of things. One hundred and sixty odd clients. Well, how, how many advisors have you got looking after those clients? Well, really, it was down to two. So Rod and yeah. I, my, my business partner, Rod Cobain and myself, had got to the point where we pretty well had filled up our capability. Yes. And uh, the last two years, um, well, a, a bit longer than that, nothing like a bit of COVID and sitting in your basement uh, for a couple of years to give you a chance to <laughs> contemplate life, if you know what I mean. I think that's probably a very Melbourne comment, but... Um, one of the decisions we needed to make is we either put a top on this and said, well, that's us. We'll just sit here and do what we did yesterday over and over again. Or we needed to make a decision of whether we were going to allow the practice to continue to grow and how were we going to do that. Yeah. And so we took a real focus on thinking about what growth required. And probably the last three years have been, you know, we, we bought in a business consultant, we bought in a brand consultant, and we really we, we really tried to get the efficiency of your practice to a level that it could tolerate growth. Yep. Because, you know, I, I think, you know, I've been around long enough, you've been around long enough now, James, you just look a lot younger than you are. So, you know, you know I'm a bit <laughs> jealous of you there. Um, but we've been around long enough to watch people destroy the happy place that they create. Yes. By allowing unfettered growth without putting putting in place the structures to support that. So I, I think we've done a lot of that work over the last three years. We now operate with myself, Rod, and two senior advisors with us. Right, okay. And the support structures in place to manage that as well. So we, we've had to make that transition while still maintaining that personal service commitment that we would like to think that we're renowned for. 
Yeah. But so, but so, what will that then, with with the extra couple of advisors, what what will that allow you to be able to grow to over the next few years? If you've got one hundred and sixty odd clients now. Well, the way the way we did operate, I think we had a maximum a maximum capacity of around about sixty clients. Yes. For advisors. So once we broke through one hundred and twenty, we were getting into no man's land a bit. The the mm. we were struggling to maintain it. Um. With the improved efficiency underneath, I think we can move that number from around about sixty to a maximum of about a hundred. Okay. And but the, the the other thing that we've had to change our focus on is as we've we've pretty well committed to two advisors per uh, client, but the the role of our new advisors is to become number one chair and push us to number two, where we still are involved with the client, we're still knowledgeable of the client. But a lot of that day-to-day work of the maintenance of the client is now being handled by those new advisors, which I think would give them, with the support that we've now put in place, the capacity to grow their maximum number somewhere between 60 and 100, I'd suggest. Okay. And so what does a typical client look like for you then? Because there's a lot of businesses out there that are saying, oh, my... I mean, my advisors can can look after 200 clients or, or, you know, something, you know, some of these, these kind of big numbers. And then you're saying... For, for the level of service and and the type of client that you're working with, that sixty to eighty mark was was why you were capping out. What what does a typical client of yours look like? Well, probably I mean probably the best clients for us are people that are investing somewhere between one to two million and eight to ten million. Okay, you know just that's just using asset base as an indicator, but. You know, I mean, fundamentally, you need to have the capacity. We believe to be earning. $10,000 or more from a client for them to be able to afford to buy a ticket on this bus. Gotcha. And, and and you need to be very clear about that and very honest and upfront because, you know, it's been interesting. It doesn't mean that everybody that we engage with has a million dollars worth of assets, but we've, we've also found it quite successful saying the clients that might have sub that level that, that we will charge them a fee to bring them up to the $10,000 mark and allow them to um, evolve to be able to be fully functioning at that level. Yeah. But but, but it's interesting, you know, if, if you think about the world we live in today, I'll, I'll just take a moment on this thinking process. The world we live in today, there is hardly any other professionals in our lives that know who the hell we are, mm. that actually answer their telephone. Instead of hearing those immortal words of, your call is important to us, and if only we were honest enough to finish the sentence, it goes, your call is important to us, but not important enough to employ enough staff to answer the phone. <laughs> and we all hate it. We all, yeah. you know, I mean, I do. But when I get that level of service, I despise it. Yes. But we tolerate it because it's cheap, because we think we get it cheaper. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of the thinking that Rod and I went through and challenging each other, pushing each other to be able to articulate this was an important part of forming a practice of this nature. Um, I mean, just about every conference I go to at the moment says, quotes the statistics, I, I think, and, and you could probably correct me if you think I'm wrong, but they say the average number of, cl- of clients per advisor in Australia is 130. Yes. And we've got to get that to 230. And I look at that and I go, for who? That's not for the client. Yeah. The client's not going to get a better experience at that level, but they will get a more cost-effective experience because that's the other thing that comes with this type of thinking. You have to be willing to acknowledge that fundamentally we're only capable of servicing 3 or 4% of the population, really. Yeah. We will never solve the, the, the really difficult challenge that we as Australians face that there's not enough advice for the needs that need to be met. Yeah. So what what have you done on the the efficiency front? Like you you mentioned, you've you've done a bit of work there, brand and, and and so forth. But can you talk about some of the internals of your business that you've that you've done to make things a bit more efficient for you to be able to look after more clients? I, th- I think n- number one was recognizing you know you, when you're doing this type of work, you have to go backwards to go forwards. You have to be willing to to you know getting a business consultant in who who didn't necessarily bring. Anything we didn't necessarily know, but I think the expression we use for uh, Philip in the work he does with us, he's our uncomfortable friend. <laughs> he, he, he pushes us, he prods us, he challenges us, he holds us to account. 
Because if you're going to drive change, you need all of those things. Mm. And I think that commitment then allowed us to focus on saying, right, let's really look at this review process because, I mean, what, 80% of our work is actually maintaining service to current clients and actually building the systems and process behind that to be able to do that more efficiently. And it's been really interesting watching the impact of that. Yep. Okay. We're doing and- something on our new business uh, structure. Yep. You know, how do we engage with clients more efficiently yet still maintain that personal knowledge, personal feel, but just in- embrace technology where we can? You know, we're seeing AI starting to come through to some degree. Yes. Uh, you know, our ability to record meetings uh, and actually get a concise summary of the meeting and the outcomes. I mean, obviously, you can see that on Teams and Zoom, et cetera, but you you add to that the next level of AI, which is more financial planning focused, yes. where you start to get back your notes, cut into the, you know, this is what we said about estate planning. This is what we said about investments. And I think that's very powerful stuff. Are you using any of those now? Yep. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah. Um, what are you using? Um, gee, I'm trying to remember the name right off the top of my head. Um I think it might be BMI because we've now got an office manager who was given the responsibility to go and put this on. So whereas like five years ago, I would have known all of that. Yeah, because you, you, you were the person make, in charge of making that decision. <laughs> and implementing it. <laughs> whereas now we've got somebody there who's is really good at that sort of stuff and is going to put it in place. It's not a dramatic cost, though. It's like $130 an advisor per month. Okay. So, you know, this and and... If it wasn't this, there's lots more coming that is getting smarter in how it actually operates. And so um, we're trying to embrace the good of AI. I mean, we all you hear lots of headlines about the bad, but there's uh, there's a lot of good coming as well that will improve our efficiencies, I believe. Yeah. Now, I, now I've known you for, for, for a long while, but, I'll, but I've kind of always known you to have really strong, deep relationships with your clients. And like all of us as financial advisors, we always talk about the relationships that we have with clients. But- from from what I've known of you, it's it seems to be at a different at, at another level. I, at least I get the the opinion that it's an, at another level. Can can you run through the like what is it? What does a typical engagement look like for one of your clients, like on a yearly basis? You know, I, I don't imagine you're seeing them once a year for an annual review. Can can you talk through your 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 sequence of meetings or or, or, or touch points you'd have with a client across the year? Depending on what the client pays, they can range from um, uh, somebody that pays us north of ten thousand dollars. We'll do two two meetings per year. Yes, um, we push for at least one of them to be in person. Yep. Because whilst the convenience of what we're doing right now is terrific, it does not come up to the same quality, in our opinion, as a personal meeting. You know, the ability to see and read body language. Uh, the ability to get people to go and get in their car together and travel to the office gets them in the headspace mm. of being ready for advice. Whereas sometimes if you just get a, you know, put your pants on if you're lucky, sit down at a computer screen, it does not does not get them in the same place as that does. Okay. And so that means us committing time. The reviews themselves are quite structured. Um, again, we look for ways to create order out of chaos all the time to create simplicity out of the complex, you know, and I, I, I make, you know, those statements are things that remind us all the time of what we're trying to achieve because our job, I believe, is to put these people in the position of making informed decisions. Yes. And now um, they're not going back to university to learn what you and I have. Why the hell would you, why have a dog and bark yourself? Yeah. Our job is to actually put them in a knowledgeable position so they make those informed decisions and the deeper engagement comes from, you know, things like doing people's estate planning with them. Not, you know, I don't write wills, but I certainly define their needs in that process so I know which one of their children they don't like. Yeah. But, you know, that type of work is quite insightful. And now what that's starting to do, this intergenerational wealth issue, is doing the maths for them so that they understand if you really want to do something positive with your children, and you've got more money than you're ever going to spend in your life, you can start to explore the possibilities of doing that earlier. Yes. Which then in, in, introduces the challenge of us making sure we get to know these beneficiaries pretty well, pretty pretty quickly. <laughs> but again, it's about, um, 
and, and and there is process behind this. You know, some of the it's interesting. You know, rather than my, my business partner and I have been doing this for a number of years. I mean, more than thirty years for myself. So there's natural ability that's evolved and developed over that period of time. But now we have younger advisors that you know. One of the things I say to them: my job is to get you twenty years ahead of where I was when you were there. Yeah. How how do I how do I impart some of that knowledge that we've learned quicker? Than anybody ever gave to us, mm. and so we need to develop some process around that. And I, um, Rod and I took ourselves off and did uh, a couple of days on a course a number of years ago now, and started to learn a process that others have developed about how to engage people effectively and really dig into their goals. Like you know, I mean, you can almost handwrite goals for people most of the time; they're pretty standard. You know? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. but. But then, when you really start to dig into the values behind them, it that really lifts it, it. It takes you into a deeper level with that particular client. And so, the thing we're learning at the moment is, and the Rod and I have to demonstrate this by following the same processes, because if you ask other people to do that and you don't do it, that's not leadership, is it? No. And uh, and so we're now learning together how to use that process, role playing it with each other. As advisors, and trying to 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 become more efficient in delivering that deeper engagement that you speak of, because I do think it's important. And, and is that uh, are you using a similar thing to you know, the, the 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 senior advisors and so forth that you that you've employed? You commented about trying to bring them up to speed so that they're twenty years ahead of where you were at that same time. How how are you how are you doing that? Well, number one, because we do the, the, um, met, certainly our first engagement meetings we do together. So I've got a first engagement meeting tomorrow morning. I've sat down with uh, uh, Daniel Jones, who's uh, uh, been with us over two years now, and we've planned out the meeting about when, which one's he going to, where's he playing lead and I'm playing colour, mm-hmm. and where's he play, where am I playing lead and he's playing colour, which is a bit of a challenge because I have to learn to shut up uh, <laughs> and let him get on his feet and take that position with the client. You know, even skills like that, you know, like poking them and saying, you know, no, no, you stand now. Yes. Don't sit, stand, different role. The person that stands in the room is the teacher. Yeah. And so if you don't get to your feet, even though you might feel a bit uncomfortable, then you will not take that position with the client. So those are skills that we're sharing and the process we're following about, and, and, you know, I need to give credit where credit's due, uh, the Fitzpatrick group did quite a lot of work developing a thing called 10 to 3 now. Oh, yes. And that's a, it, it's just a structure and follows many of the values that Rod and I share, but it puts a structure that you can then impart to other people. And then, you know, a lot of the training is about demonstrating in front of these advisors with the client and role-playing it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you go and if, if – People with great solutions that haven't got the capacity to influence the client to do something with it, to me, has always been a very sad indictment for some people. And they're not, you know, that's, it's not good enough to have the right answer. It's got to be the right answer that the client implements yep. for it to deliver real value. Yep. Okay. Now, one of the, one of the kind of the conferences or something you know, down, down the road here that I heard you speak at a, a little while ago, you'd mo- moved to a, a managed account kind of world in, 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 in your business. Um, and from what I heard you speak, I actually like the, the take that, you're, that you've taken on the implementation of, of managed accounts. Can, can you talk about your, kind of, I guess, the, the world that you're in now and, and, and what's led you to, to, to that type of approach when it comes to the investment advice with your clients? Sure. Um, so I think we read about six or seven years ago, you know, I'd, I'd seen the technology uh, developing and the technology made an awful lot of sense. But I must admit, six or seven years ago, I, I had deep concerns about how some people were implementing it. And, and that was two elements. One is, you know, for 30 years, we've been building portfolios that, oh, this, this is the conservative bucket, and this is the balance bucket, and this is the growth bucket. And like, you know, I was doing that back in the 90s. Yeah. And yet, and yet I was watching people embrace this new technology and go and build exactly the same as what we've been doing for 30 years. And I'm kind of going, you know, if... There are moments of inflection that you've got to really think about what you're doing. So that that was one concern I had. The other one was six or seven years ago, people were still trying to hide fees. You know, they were actually implementing managed accounts to try to get a fee, 
that the client couldn't figure out all the time. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I kind of look at that and go, guys, you know, those days are behind us. You know, it's about an efficient way of delivering something more than it is about, if you want to charge an extra fee, charge them an extra advice fee. Just have the courage to put it in front of the client. Mm -hmm. But the point I'd make for that was that, um, so we committed to the idea that instead of building the conservative balanced growth, what we were going to do is we, we look back at the fundamentals of what it is that we engage the client about. Is it this fund manager over that fund manager? Is it this share is better than that share? Uh, what value does that really add to the client conversation? And, and our opinion was minimal. The real decision that you make with the client and the client needs to make in an informed manner is this balance between defensive and growth. Yep. And in doing that, we made the decision to only build two SMAs in our particular practice. One is a defensive pool of money where the primary goal is preservation of capital through a relatively short cycle and beat catch. A growth portfolio, which can be 100% invested in growth assets, or as it is right now, a, a significant percentage defensive, which gives us a tactical tool to work with the client. And then your engagement with the client is not just sticking them in a bucket, it's quite bespoke. We're looking for the balance between defensive and growth. And on the defensive side, you add cash, term deposits, maybe maybe even some annuities, which are now starting to come into market and be worth strategic discussion again. Or on the growth side, you may well have them client consent assets where somebody's got unrealized CGT that needs to be managed or something like that. But fundamentally, it's a balance between growth and defensive. And that's so of the 360 million that we run in the practice now, about 280 sits in those two pools. Yeah, got gotcha. you. Yeah, so yeah, because it, it you know, we, and we still follow follow, and I'm sure you do this idea of the three buckets, and you it kind of implemented a three bucket bucket one being your cash and term deposits that you just said, bucket two being the the defensive portfolio, and bucket three being that that growth portfolio. But instead of putting instead of putting everyone in, you know, they're in the the zero percent profile or the two percent profile or the four percent profile. You're uh, each is bespoke for, for one client to the next, the mix that they have. Funnily enough, at the end of the day, they end up, um, you know, I mean, I've, I've always had that philosophy when it comes to investment that fundamentally, and, and I think some people don't like me saying this, we're nothing more than glorified roller coaster attendants. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you actually think about the, the fundamentals of our work, it's one is to make sure they get on the right roller coaster, but the really, really hard bit. The thing that requires skill, expertise, and the ability to manage the people that you lead is the ability to keep them seated for the duration of the, uh, the ride. Yes. Yep. Without a mechanical buffer to hold them in their seat. Yeah. And I, you know, you, you see it time after time when you know when it all hits the fan, and we all know that that's coming. You know, anyone that's in this industry that acts surprised when they get hit by a GFC or whatever the next one is. I hasn't read history enough to understand that that's inevitable. Yes. In fact, it's one of the few things you'd guarantee your client, and you should be guaranteeing your client. Say, I guarantee you we're going to sit together at some point and your portfolio, if you choose to sell it on that day, will be worth 20% less than it was. So I've said it. Let's not act surprised about it. We know it's going to happen, and it's part of the journey that we have along the way. And so you actually, it's, it's interesting, you develop, you develop sayings and things that you just impregnate a client, probably not the correct word to use, but <laughs> uh, uh, the client with an understanding. Like, you know, constantly at the moment I'm saying, look, what we're fundamentally doing for you right now is taking you from the front of the wave to the back of the wave. We're not smart enough to take you off the wave. Mm. But, but by doing that, what we're actually doing is recognizing that we live in a world where there are reasonably significant risks with elevated markets, uncertainty about how we come out of the interest rate changes. And in those circumstances, we'd prefer to be cautious with your life savings. Do you think that's the right approach? And I'll guarantee you, clients will look at you and go, yeah. They're all nodding. Yeah, they're not all nodding. Yeah. So with the, with the, the mechanics of, you know, there's the, there's the growth bucket and that, and that kind of defensive bucket. Who's managing the investments behind it? Do you, like, do you have an investment committee that's making that decision? Is it outsourced to Morningstar? Like, what, what happens be, behind the scenes? And that's an interesting question because it's one of the other interesting things that's happening in the industry. Um, mm. 
there's there's lots of people that are now buying their investment solution off the shelf. Yes. And, and in fairness, you talk to some of those people and say, I'm glad that you are because, you know, you, that's not your expertise and you should be buying it off the shelf. What we actually do is we certainly have somebody that joined us in our investment committee um, and they and we certainly, you know, they live and breathe the markets and things like that and bring lots of knowledge. But what we did was we kept the responsibility for the decision. So we said there's three votes on the investment committee. One is our consultant and the other two are us. And, and part of the reason is we wanted to keep the blowtorch to our belly. We want because... Because the interesting thing is that if you go too far away from how the engine actually works, it'll really get found out when the bad times come. Yeah. Because the clients will look at us and our ability to continue to hold the line with our investment beliefs. And if we if we blink at that point in time, if you hesitate at that point in time, they will take you out at the throat. And what I mean by that is they will lose confidence. Yes. And so... Nothing wrong with outsourcing, but for goodness sake, stay close enough to it that it, it fulfills your beliefs because that's what will be tested on all of us as advisors when the bad times come. Yeah. So 11 or so years in, like I, I get the opportunity to speak to a lot of people as part of this podcast that are often one or two or, or sometimes I'm reaching out to them and not even realizing they're less than one year into, the, into running their business. You're 11 or so years in. Is there anything you'd do differently if you if you could go back and, and and do it differently after that time, um, probably not. Probably not fundamentally differently because you know I was of an age and experience by that point in time that I'd made enough mistakes that we had a fundamental understanding. And especially having run dealer groups and things like that, and met with met with so many advisors, it was just always such an educational environment. I thank everybody out there that shared a little bit of their journey with me. Because uh, you gave me more to me than sometimes you realise. Yeah. Um, having having said that, we could have got on with what we've been doing in the last few years a lot earlier. But but at the time, I mean, I think in many ways, uh, you know, we'd come out of a corporatizing structure and so forth. We were quite happy just to be Rod and I back to back with a bit of support. Yeah. But now we're getting the joy and excitement of starting to build the business, starting to build the practice into the next chapter. Because this is all about, you know, how do I make myself sustainable for another 10 years? Hmm. And doing the last 10 all over again won't do that. <laughs> and, and so, you know, there's the, the, obviously work-life balance, um, all of those things getting – Getting the joy out of watching other people succeed and recognizing that through their success, I will be allowed to be. Mm. That's what this next chapter looks like. So that, that's exciting. But I think for people, they're starting out, not everybody that breathes is your client. What, what, I, would, what I would say to a young advisor is try to be articulate about the way you focus on the value that you add. Understand that clients don't have problems with fees. Advisors do. If you are confident about what you believe, if you are confident about the value you deliver, the clients will see it on you, smell it on you. They will recognize it and have confidence in that. And it doesn't have to be the same. And 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 for goodness sake, do not fall into the trap of the pursuit of cheap. Yeah. We are in the business of looking after people's life savings. When the hell was cheap ever meant to be part of that equation? I think you said it well before when when you when you said something along the lines of like a, a ticket on the bus of the business that that you have costs north of ten thousand dollars a year and you can kind of up I'm sure you're upfront with that from people people right right in the very get go uh, and it's either you're already there and yes you can get a ticket on the on the bus or if you're within striking distance of that we're going to work with you to get you there so that ten thousand dollars might sound like a lot of money but in exchange for the value and the position that you're going to be in you're going to be able to afford it and. And, and and off we go. Yeah. I think so, and I think being able to uh, and 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 what do you have to do to do that? It role play it with other people. Actually, just just sit down and go give it to them. And the first time you do it, you're bad at it and all that sort of stuff. But trust me, the more uncomfortable you are role playing it with each other, the better you're going to be in front of the client. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tim, thank you for joining me. I know you've got uh, got another engagement to get to. We'll uh, we'll maybe wrap this one up a little bit a little bit short, but 
Tim, thank you. Pleasure to, to catch up with you and I'll see you at, uh, at another event sometime soon. <laughs> James, thanks for taking the time. All the best. Thanks, Tim.